Yes, Maharaj. You can start. Om Ajnana Timaranda Recording in progress. Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Precharine Nirvise Shashanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevata Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our study of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. We're on the third canto. And today we're looking at chapter number 16 of the third chapter. Um, are you able to see my PowerPoint presentation here? Yes, my eyes. Okay, good. Okay, so lesson number five, the two doorkeepers of Vaikuntha, Jai and Vijay, cursed by the sages. Here's the, the main sections which come in this chapter. In the previous chapter, you'll remember, chapter 15. We heard how the four Kumaras had entered into Vaikuntha. But when they entered to the seventh gate, they were stopped by the two gatekeepers, Jai and Vijay. So then the four Kumaras were upset and they got angry and they felt that these two doorkeepers didn't deserve to be there. They thought they didn't belong in the spiritual world. So the four Kumaras actually cursed that Jai and Vijay that they should go to the material world. And it was at that time when the Lord came, Lord Padmanabha appeared there immediately. It says that Lord Padmanabha came immediately because he, was, he, he, he didn't even wait for Garuda to bring him. He immediately came on foot 
because he, he wanted, he didn't want there to be any further uh, disruption between them. All right, so then the Lord came and he is speaking. That, well, first of all, the four Kumaras were very happy, of course, to see Lord Padmanabha. And we had that nice verse, Tashyaravinda, Nayana Shapararavinde, like that. that the, they saw the beauty of the Lord, they smelt the aroma of the Tosis from his lotus feet, and they experienced a change in their heart. They experienced a change from impersonalism to devotees. Previously they had been jnanis, but after seeing... You know, it's very disturbing when there's a lot of noise in the background. I don't know what somebody's doing, but somebody's making a lot of noise to stir. Usually what we have to do, we have to mute everybody because people are so noisy in the background. So the four Kumaras experienced a change from, from jnanis, they became devotees and their level of devotion is described to be shantaras that they came, they, they are examples of devotees in Shantaras. But that's better than being jnanis. All right, so the chapter begins with the Lord responding to the four Kumaras because the four Kumaras had offered their prayers, heartfelt prayers to Lord Padmanabha. And the Lord replies and he expresses his love for the devotees. And we'll hear about it. And then the chapter continues, the four Kumaras remain submissive. Although Lord Padmanabha describes his love for his devotees, and who are his devotees? Well, they're all his, the four Kumaras are, have become devotees. And Jai and Vijaya are also his devotees, of course. Actually, the Acharyas describe that Jai and Vijay are more intimately connected to the Lord than the four Kumaras. Remember, the four Kumaras, they were coming from the platform of Jnana, from the platform of impersonalism. They were fixed on the platform of Brahman. But Jai and Vijay, they were, enga they were engaged in intimate service for the Lord. So the, the relationship between the Lord and Jai and Vijay was more, in, was more meaningful than the relationship between the Lord and the four Kumaras. And the four Kumaras remain submissive, all right? They hear the Lord speaking about the glories of his devotee and love for his devotees. So the, the four Kumaras then begin to consider that Actually, they were wrong, that they shouldn't have cursed the gatekeepers. So we have this section 26 to 34, who was actually at fault? The gatekeepers or the four Kumar? Actually, when we hear the text, the Lord also says, the Lord said it's his fault. And the gatekeepers say it's their fault, and the four Kumar say it's our fault. And they're all feeling guilty, they're all expressing their guilt. So very interesting. And then the chapter finishes with Brahma's concluding words to the demigods. All right, so this is the chapter. It's a nice chapter. We'll go through the main points here in the PowerPoint. All right, could somebody read this first slide, please? To commit an offense, Hare Krishna Prabhupada. Uh, to commit an offense at the feet of a devotee of the Lord is a great wrong. Even when a living entity is promoted to Vaikuntha, there is still the chance that he may commit offenses. But the difference is that when one is in a Vaikuntha planet, even if by chance one commits an offense, he is protected by the Lord. This is the remarkable fact in the dealings of the Lord and the servitor, 
as seen in the present incident the word atikramam used here in indicates that in offending himself shrimad bhagavatam 3.16.2 Thank you, man. You're neglecting the Lord Himself. Of course, we know offences against the devotees very serious. There is a mad elephant offence, the first offence in the chanting of the holy name. But it is surprising to note here that even if we go to Vaikuntha, recording Vaikun stopped. It it's surprising to note that when we go to commit offences. We would think that in Vaikuntha, because we heard there's perfect harmony, we were, dis we were dis studying the nature of the Vaikuntha world in the previous chapter, and it was described there how there's perfect harmony in Vaikuntha. So we may think there's no possibility of any offence. But there is still the chance that one may commit offence. However, there is a distinction. And the distinction is that if we commit an offence in the Vaikuntas, the, the, we are protected by the Lord. So who had committed an offence? The doorkeepers. The doorkeepers. Actually, actually, four Kumaras. Yeah, we would, we could think the four Kumaras. We could think also the two doorkeepers, that the two door doorkeepers. And why, why are, why is it the two? Why are the two doorkeepers considered to be offensive? What did they do wrong? Because they barred the entrance of uh, four Kumaras. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, because uh, as in the four Kumaras will tell that uh, this is Vaikuntha, so um, everyone is in harmony as Maharaj said. So why do you think that uh, there is a danger to the Lord? Uh, he is the Lord, he is control of everything. So why do you think like that? So you are not fit but, uh, um, to be present in this planet. But, that, uh, but Jai, and J Jai and Vijay, they are thinking, what, well, these just children? How could they yeah. be qualified yeah. to come to the spiritual world? Yes. So what? <laughs> how do we? Argue? Also, that is also that is their job. I mean, uh, the doorkeepers are there to you know uh, protect. Um, I mean, to give privacy to Padmanava. Yes. Yeah, if we could say like that. The, the doorkeeper's job is to stop people from entering. Just like when Prabhupada would come, you know, Prabhupada, they would always put some security around Prabhupada's room so people wouldn't go in and disturb Prabhupada. <laughs> so, the same way, Lord Padmanabha, he has also uh, some guard, security guards there protecting. And we could also, however, the argument is that to get into the spiritual world, means they must be pure. If they were not pure, they wouldn't be able to enter to the spiritual world. So, how could there be any uh, wrong in the four Kumaras coming in? But somehow they've entered, they've entered into that region, and so they must have, they must have been pure. They had no, they, they were somehow they were qualified, they were able to enter. If they had not been qualified, they wouldn't have been able to, they would not have been able to enter. And then, oh. and what, and the, 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 the two gatekeepers tried to stop them, and the four Kumaras, what is their offence? Man, that without knowing their cursing. Without uh, knowing, their, without their knowing what? Without knowing that how uh, dear they are to Krishna and uh, why they are stopping and what is their role. Without knowing how pure, uh, how, uh, yeah, pure devotee, they are cursing them. Without knowing who? 
about the gatekeepers without knowing about the gatekeepers that whether they are pure devotee or not whether that they're doing their job they're cursing thinking that oh they are imposters without knowing that they're not imposters and all mm. yeah how should they have known that they're not imposters i i think that they should be more calm and uh because they are gyani they could have understood if they are not overcome by <laughs> ignorance <laughs> by anger <laughs> mm they shouldn't have been so quick maharaj i'd like to add something yes prabhu go ahead uh maharaj if i if my understanding is correct an offense only works when the person uh, against whom we have committed an offense he is hurt and he feels bad so chatur kumaras were hurt when uh, the two door keepers didn't allow them to enter so that that then that's an offense and when they cursed them the door keepers they also felt bad because they were vaishnavas so that was an offense yeah, am i correct maharaj well i've never heard this before prabhu i've never heard this before that the person has to feel hurt in order for the the effect of the offense to be there you know uh, uh, it's an interesting point but i've never heard it made like i've never seen anywhere where it's made like that there, there are many cases where pure devotees are treated wrongly you know but the pure devotee himself never takes any offense you know people may deal un, unpleasantly with devotees now the pure devotees they're transcendental they don't take offense but the people who offend them they get punished they get reactions yes yes maharaj maharaj in case when uh, one srupa goswami was meditating on some past time and one uh, vaishnava who was uh, i think bodily deformed he passed and then uh, he uh, mis by mistake he uh, thought that rupa goswami is the laughing on him so he was hurt and then that was an offense i don't know if it it is like that Right. Yeah well it, yeah I I know the past time yeah Rupa Goswami was laughing he was meditating on some Krishna leela and the brahmana took offense and the brahmana thought that Rupa Goswami was laughing at him but Rupa Goswami was laughing because he was meditating he had seen some amusing event take place between Krishna and the gopis when they were all bathing and so Rupa Goswami was laughing at that and that affected his meditation because the brahmana took offense at the laughing of rupa goswami the rupa goswami's meditation was not able to be effective from that point and he had to beg forgiveness from the brahmana and explain to the brahmana that he was not laughing at him yes yes maharaj Uh, can you say something maharaj yes please to prabhu uh, maharaj as you sir asked why uh, they were angry like that so uh, they they have crossed the six gates and they were not uh, uh, debarred so um, that may be cause that they uh, they became angry they became angry in the seventh gate why seventh gate they were debarred in the six, six gates uh, no one uh, debarred them so why in the seventh gate that may be a question that may be a point maharaj I'm I'm not able to understand your voice so well Prabhu it was not so clear Maharaj he passed all six gates Yes and there they were not debarred Right Then why in the seventh gate they debarred <laughs> that may be cause Maharaj <laughs> Yes, well, uh, uh, the, from the information we're given, there were no gatekeepers at the other six gates. They just entered in. Okay, 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 Maharaj. Okay. So, but when they got to the seventh gate, then the two gatekeepers were there. But previously, okay, there had been no gatekeepers. That's okay, Maharaj. How I understood. Maharaj, I have a question. Can I ask? <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Can I ask? All right. What's your question? so maharaj in this past time we see that uh, there is clearly two devotee parties uh, that are having a conversation and uh, both sides there has been a misunderstanding in one way 
or obviously we know from the acharya's commentary that this is the lord's uh, desire but in iskon now we we are learning to uh, get trained in devotional etiquette so that we can make it to the spiritual world there are many times we do not recognize a devotee because uh, external appearances can be misunderstood at the same time uh, somebody's internal desire or sincerity cannot also be judged from an external level so as we grow in our devotional uh, path and as we grow uh, by being more uh, in this devotional uh, you know uh, line how do we train ourselves in such a way that we deal with devotees in a way that uh, the judging becomes less but not in an artificial way that maybe we don't judge but when we come home then the whole day we're judging them in the mind well we're so we we're, we're, go we're, we're going to talk about these things this is coming up in a few just uh, just okay, now thank you, Mara. these thank points you. are going thank to come up yeah Maharaj, you wanted to say something yes Maharaj. um in our previous class, actually, this was discussed, so I just want, I remember this, I wanted to uh, say this, that uh, because they were, the four Kumaras were impersonalist, so that is why they were not uh, given entry inside the uh, seventh gate. So this was actually pointed out in our previous class that um, that is why Krishna uh, Padmanava comes out to show them, uh, uh, to show them, and you know, uh, you know, make them Krishna conscious. But they were not allowed because of their offenses which they have done. The four Kumaras they were actually not allowed inside. So from the gate itself, they were, you know, told to leave. So this is uh, this is why I also think that yes, four Kumaras are, have actually offended than uh, the gatekeeper. Gatekeepers were doing the duty which was given to them. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't know about all this. Uh, you know, we could say that the four Kumaras. So, you know, to enter into the spiritual world, just like Durvasa Muni could enter into the spiritual world. He was not a devotee, but he could enter there. He could enter into Vaikuntha. That, but the point is they entered, but they don't stay. So the four Kumaras entered, and as they entered, the Lord came and he gave mercy to them. So he, he understood their situation. They were not offensive, and they were pure. In, the, in, the, in their minds, they had no material desires. They come there, and the, the Lord was willing to give his, the shelter of his lotus feet to them. So they did become devotees. So we can't say that they had to leave, because they actually did become devotees. When they saw the Lord, and they offered feeling prayers to him. So I don't fully agree with everything. Like that, you say they had to leave. I, I don't, you know. Yeah, uh, but they did not enter, right? They did not enter the seventh gate. From the gate itself, they had to go back. Well, they didn't. Did they have to go back? But they actually became devotees. It describes how they became devotees. The verse was there. They smelt the aroma of the tulsi leaves from his lotus feet, and their devotion awakened. And it actually said that they became mm. de their devotees on the level of Shantaras. So you can't say they had to leave. Yeah, maybe they did leave, but usually they stayed in Four Kumaras, they stay more in Tapaloka, which is one of the higher planets there in the universe. But they, it wasn't like they were told, get out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're not qualified. No, no rather that, uh, of course, they, they didn't have the intimate relationship with Jai and Vijay have with the Lord, but they did, they did become devotees. They awakened their devotion because the Lord came, personally came, He appeared to them. And then by uh, seeing the Lord, they had become devotees. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, one quick question. Um, this always had in, I, I had in, this, in my mind that impersonalist means who are, who, are, who believes in uh, merging into Brahman, right? 
So these four Kumaras, how did they become impersonalists? Because well, um, it, it's it's not that they have to merge into. They can be Brahmagyanis. There, there's also Brahmagyanis. It's not that they just believe in merging. The, the Brahmagyanis, they simply they're satisfied on the platform of Brahman. Now they'd heard about the Lord from Lord Brahma, but they'd never actually seen the Lord. So they were, they were, they 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 had a, they had been attracted by the Brahman, but they had never actually had the opportunity to see the Lord. But once they saw him, then they awakened their devotion for him. So they came. So, so, so the, why didn't they? Uh, why didn't they have the feeling of love for uh, a personal form of Krishna? Because they already got the information. Like we, we have, we also did not see with our material eyes. Yeah, but, but we are attracted to Krishna's form. Well, they are. They are attracted to the Lord's form. When they saw the Lord's form, they were very attracted. That attraction was there. As soon as they saw the Lord's form, they became attracted. And they, they gave up their impersonalism and they, they gave up that attachment, the identification with the Brahman and they immediately awakened their devotion and offered prayers to the Lord. Yeah. Before, why didn't they become like that, Maharaj? Because they well, it's already a, it, it's a pastime. It's a leela to show us. That they can be that even one is on the platform of Brahman, that he won't be satisfied there. That until he awakens devotion, he won't be satisfied. Okay, Maharaj. Thank so, you, Maharaj. We have to see these examples. Okay, we have to go ahead. Let's go ahead. Someone read the next verse. This is text number four. <laughs> A wrong act committed by a servant is on of rescue. Hare Krishna. Can I have someone read text number four, the next slide? As the highest and most beloved personality, the disrespect shown by my attendants has actually been displayed by me because the doormen are my servitors. I take this to be an offense by myself. Therefore, I seek your forgiveness for the incident that has arisen. So what is the Lord saying? Prabhu, can you give us a simple language? What is the Lord saying? Uh, a person in management, basically if someone's higher, if people below them commit any Yes, Srila Prabhupada, if somebody wrote to Prabhupada complaining and he forced me to buy a book and I had to give him money, you know, I didn't, you know, he, the man wrote complaining and so Prabhupada would write back and say, I'm very sorry. He would say, I am very sorry. Prabhupada would apologize to him because he considered the devotee to be his representative. So similarly here also, the Lord is apologizing on behalf of Jai and Vijay. So he the Lord says, I take this to be an offense by myself. I seek your forgiveness. Okay, go ahead, read text number five. A wrong act committed by a servant leads people in general to blame his master. Just as a spot of white leprosy on any part of the body pollutes all of the skin. Alright, yeah, the servitor, the servant represents the master. So the disciple is distributing, preaching Krishna consciousness, he's representing Srila Prabhupada. We must be very cautious. Okay, here's a little exercise just in relation to what we're talking about here. A devotee should always see that his Vaishnava qualities increase with the advancement of his Krishna consciousness. A devotee should be blameless because any offense by the devotee is a scar on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The devotee's duty is to be always conscious in his dealings with others, especially with another devotee of the Lord. 
Discussing groups the practical relevance of the above statement for ISKCON devotees in general. Without going into groups, which takes so much time, we just want to take some feedback from the, the devotees. Uh, you've already commented a little on it. One devotee already brought it up. That ISKCON devotees in general, we have to consider this, right? It's a very important, very relevant for all of us in ISKCON, dealing with each other, dealings with others, especially with another devotee. Is, it, is this relevant for us? Undoubtedly, right? Anybody? Yes, yeah, would you like to comment on this? Sure, Marge. Um, we see that, uh, I think it was mentioned in one of the previous classes about ISKCON Resolve. Yeah. We see that they have a structure like that, even for at the level of the GBC and other leadership structures. So it's, it's very relevant that disagreements will happen. Um, but yeah, we need a form of mediation. Uh, that's one way to resolve it, but also, um, yeah, devotees need to be more sensitive, communicate clearly, and yeah, I don't know what else to say, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's an important subject, it's a very important subject matter that needs to be done. Yeah, we, you know, we, we, go, we work it against ourselves, if we cannot work together, of course, Prabhup, there's Prabhupada's famous quote, which he gave before he left the world, that your love for me will be shown by how you all cooperate with each other after I'm gone. And we do face these challenges that working with each other, it's a challenge, you know, because somehow we allow the personality of Kali to infiltrate into our midst and we begin, we begin to argue with each other and we split into factions and different groups and it defeats our own purpose. So we do want to try to somehow create the Vaikuntha mood, which is based on harmony. So it's particularly relevant for devotees. We don't want to, we want to show an example to others. You know, people generally come to Krishna consciousness looking to get away from the influence of Kali Yuga. And if they come into the ISKCON society and find us all arguing with each other, they'll think these people are no different from outside. So we defeat our own purposes if we're not working together. It's a challenge, it's certainly difficult because, you know, we do have our own different ideas, different different ways in which things we want to do, different methods we want to do. And so it's a challenge, but somehow we have to consider the higher purpose. Is that all right? Anybody want to comment on that? Just one other point, Marge. I was thinking as well that, especially with the rise of social media, it's made criticism, fault finding and all these other things a lot easier because you don't have to confront the other person face-to-face. Uh, -face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> back in the day where this media channels and everything wasn't there, mm. um, yeah, we, I think people probably committed less offences. Mm. Uh, whereas now it's a lot easier to spread hate as we see. Um, yeah, that's all much. Yeah, anything you want, put it on Facebook and it's read by millions of people. Huh? Yeah, we have to be. Marge, yeah. can I ask another question? Well, you can ask. I don't know if I can answer. So, Marge, just like you, uh, you mentioned that this is such a critical thing for us as devotees. We also understand that uh, ISKCON is an institution that has been formed to help us get closer to Krishna and to Prabhupada. And uh, our love is there, so we are loyal. But we're also not blind to the fact that uh, ISKCON is growing as a movement. You mentioned in the first class that yes, we've made mistakes in the past. We might make mistakes in the future. But also the institution has a capacity to
to which it can come down to the individual level and help all of us in our problems. Like uh, Prabhuji mentioned, this can resolve. You find that's kept for very serious issues and for parties who agreed to let ISKCON Resolve be the arbitrator. But in other situations where temples have individual powers, right, that's the ISKCON structure, decentralized. The real solution then for the masses is what? Is it our sadhana? Is it that we keep quiet till we understand uh, maybe with certainty that how we should behave? Uh, is it that uh, there should be more training programs? So, at the, from your experience, Maharaj, of so many years, what do you advise us? At least so we we make it back to God without doing foolish mistakes or offensing. Well, <laughs> what do I advise? Uh, generally, uh, yeah, training is very nice. If, if we have more training programs, that's good. And also, we have to become a little bit detached. You can't be too much attached to your way and your thinking. You know, people say, my way or the highway. You know, they want, they want their way. It's got to be my way, no other way. <laughs> we have to be flexible. We have to live and let live. And uh, sometimes you just have to let things go, even though you may know it, it, this is not going to work. But if it's not going to work, then sometimes it takes time before people can understand. And it takes time for things to change. So that's generally what's required. There has to be some tolerance, you know, you have to be willing to, okay, you know, if, if this is got, how it's going to be, what can I say? You just have to go along with it. So don't be too much attached to having your own way. I think that's important. And yet yeah, ISKCON resolve is certainly good, but as you said, not everybody agrees. You know, we had an issue recently and the devotees said, no, we don't agree, we're not going to go to ISKCON resolve. <laughs> oh, Krishna, <laughs> what to do? You get these kind of things. Okay, we'll go ahead. Okay, here's text number six. Would someone like to read this section for us? In other words, a Vaishnava should not be evaluated in terms of his body. The Shastra states that no one should think the deity in the temple to be made of wood or stone. And no one should think that a person coming from a lower caste family who has taken to Krishna consciousness is still of the same low caste. These attitudes are forbidden because anyone who takes to Krishna consciousness is understood to be fully purified. He is at least engaged in the process of purification, and if he sticks to the principle of Krishna consciousness, he will be very soon be fully purified. The conclusion is that if one takes to Krishna consciousness with all seriousness, he is to be understood as already purified, and Krishna is ready to give him protection by all means. The Lord assures herein that he is ready to give protection to his devotee, even if there is a need to cut off a part of his own body. Yes. So this is the Lord's assurance that he wants he will give protection to his devotee, even to the extent he's willing to cut off part of his own body. You know, there are a few statements here which we may doubt. Where, for example, it mentions that uh, anyone who takes to Krishna consciousness is understood to be fully purified. Mm, well, mm, who has actually taken to Krishna consciousness? That's another question. When people may join the movement, they may have different motives. Have they actually taken to Krishna consciousness? And sometimes these things are questionable. <laughs> but Prabhupada would always be very lenient and merciful and considered everyone a devotee that they've come to Krishna consciousness. And as he said, if we stick to the principles very soon, very soon, we don't know what very soon means, you'll be fully purified. And so it, it, it's, it's difficult, it's sometimes, you know, we're challenged. 
But the principle is there. He's a devotee. We should be respectful. We should deal with him. Another little exercise for us to think about. On the basis of verses 4 to 12, this is first section dealing with the Lord's relationship with his devotees. Discuss various aspects of the Lord's relationship with his devotees. Also discuss various reasons why we fail to see devotees in the proper perspective. And discuss practical ways and means so that we can view devotees in the right perspective. So this is very much in relation to that question the devotee was bringing up here at the beginning of the class. I thought, you know, wait till it comes up here. So here's your chance. Would you like to have some group work on this? Would you, do you think it would be valuable if you go into groups? How we many? want your point of view, Maharaj. Huh? We want your point of view in this, Maharaj. Well, I'm also eager to hear your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly, I'll give my point of view, but I think you should also discuss yourselves. How many people do we have here? Seven. Yes, how many? Seventeen, Maharaj. One, seven. Seventeen. Uh -huh. So could, could we have groups of four and one group of five? Sure, Maharaj. So there will be three groups of four and one group of five four groups and you know there's three questions really various aspects discuss various aspects discuss various reasons why we fa fail to see so what what are the reasons why we fail to see devotees in the proper perspective and how can we view devotees in the right perspective so that's the main point of the question why do we fail to see devotees in the proper perspective? And what do we need to do so that we can see devotees in the proper way? How long do we have for discussion? I mean, uh, for uh, preparing? Well, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Also, you can join group. Yeah, Prabhu, that, that option just left. Recording stopped. Hmm? That option left? Yeah, I don't have that option here. I think mine was group four. Right now, I don't know. Right now, uh, you just check. It should be somewhere in your tier screen. I can't see it. Okay, yeah, it's fine. I because I'm admin, I can go to breakout room then, and I'll just join group four. Yeah, there's only three people. Take care. Would you like to join some group? Yes. There's already a message on your screen. Again. Really? Where? I didn't get any message. What group should I join? Group number two. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure in the 
Ramya Prabhu is speaking. Uh, Ramya Prabhu, but we are not unable to yes. Okay. We are unable to. I was trying to use some headphones, but that's making it worse. Can you hear me now? Yes, Prabhu ji. Now it is low volume. Low volume. Prabhu, uh, you are uh, not in our video? I'm not where? Okay. That is Pranam Prabhu. So okay. I, I was saying that uh, we can see how seriously the Lord takes his relationship and, and his satisfaction of all his ways. Uh, it's a top priority for him. And he never like, tries to put himself ahead of the devotees, even though he is actually the leader of the devotees and the Supreme Ishwar. Yes, sir. But I would say generally the problem seems to come because the devotees are not thinking of the Lord. There's no relationship with the Lord. It's simply that, that tendency, that conditioning is prominent there. And it's just really to try to come to a, a pure consciousness, to actually think in terms of being devotees. We're coming out of the material world, coming into Krishna conscious atmosphere, it's a big transformation and we bring a lot of conditioning with us. Yes, it's true. And sometimes we hold on to it for way too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm speaking about myself. But... Well, yeah, based on our own experiences, we know what we've, what we've been through and, you know, it, it really, it takes a long time to actually come to that level. Of course, nowadays we have a lot of a lot more congregation people, so it's maybe they're a bit more mature. But in the days of the, you know, the ashram, where everybody was living in an ashram, then it was much more. There was much more conflict. I think it's a little better now than it was before. What do you think? It's better in one sense that uh, we don't have such intense interactions daily between devotees who are, you know, very neophyte, uh, along with the others. But it's kind of shifted because it's not that they've joined the congregation, they're suddenly not neophyte. So it just comes out at different times and different ways, I find. Yeah, definitely. It will. It will come out different times, different ways. Maharaj, it is also said in Bhagavad Gita that Apichat Sudracharo Bhajatima Manandivak Sadriva Samantima Sangat Bhavushitvisa. Even if one is having so much. Uh... Okay. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay. Very short time, Maharaj. Recording in progress. Yeah, we didn't. We could have discussed this for a long time, right? <laughs> yeah. What do you think? We want another five minutes on this. <laughs> that would be good, Maharaj, because really? we couldn't uh, discuss. All right. All. Okay. Take another five minutes on it then. The only question is, how do we go back into the same groups? <laughs> oh, we can. Okay, there we go. Four. Okay. Recording in progress. The groups have changed. 
We've got all, all different people, yeah. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Oh, we're actually in the same group, I think. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was with Aditi Rata and she will both be again. Oh, we're not in the same group? No. Uh, so many people. Where's Ramya? Oh, everyone is here, actually. Something put and then we'll put back. Yeah. Prabhu. Do we need to create group, Maharaj? <laughs> well, I thought we were going back in the same group, but it seems to be a different group. I don't know. I'll try one day. <laughs> this time is uh, Oh, Ramya, yeah, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Hare Krishna. One point I was thinking is uh, very, very beneficial is like Lord Chaitanya said, this verse, Trinata peace and each and our Tarora peace and each and our, should always wear it around your neck and should be our topmost priority. So, in if you really take this to heart, a lot of the um, failures that we have between devotees would probably be, be uh, dissipated. Yeah, yeah, it's really a key factor. That, that verse is so meaningful, so important. <laughs> but just to get, get devotees <laughs> to apply it, you know. That it's it's easy to say it's another thing to do, offering all respect to others, and not being eager to be respected ourselves. We're always thinking, "I'm right," you know. I know what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> that uh, that tends to be the the mood. You know, listen to me. I know what I'm saying, you know. <laughs> They want to. Yeah, or like somehow that verse doesn't apply in one particular situation, you know. I mean, I personally saw it. I had two different devotees, authority and congregation, and they were having some disagreement. And they said, each party said, until the other party apologizes, I will not speak to them. <laughs> can't do anything for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. And where is this humility, you know? I mean, somehow they don't think that applies. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely, what can we do about it? What, what can be done, you know? What's the solution? You can't, you can't force it. You can be an example. And Look, you can preach it, but you can't force it. Just we just have to give in to them, to the other party. We just give it because you know if they if they don't want to, they don't want to have, you know they don't want to go to resolve. <laughs> they <Yeah>. don't. <laughs> they will. Well, I tried speaking about that. You know, okay, you take the position and tolerate, and they said no, I won't. <laughs> so then, problem remains. Yeah. What can be done? We want people to stay in Krishna consciousness. We want them to be enlivened. We want them to be encouraged. Sometimes the best thing is keep everybody out of management, you know. <laughs> Don't let them get involved in management. That's the worst thing. If you can stay out of management, then you're really blessed. Yes, any shortcomings seem to get greatly magnified in that condition. Of course, Istagostis are good, you know, getting, just getting people together and talking, just somehow or other getting people together and getting them to 
just to understand each other. It, 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 but as you say, you know, you get sometimes these situations. Can't, nobody, the other, nobody wants to give in. They have to apologize to me. <laughs> it's very difficult, very challenging. So all I can conclude is that I am not pure enough, I'm not advanced enough to these devotees actually want to hear what I say. So we should all, that's the humble mood, right? To think that, you know, that I, I'm not pure. That, okay, so just keep quiet and let somebody else go ahead. Let them have their way and see what happens. <laughs> and you know, you have to also understand everyone's got different conditionings and this is a material world. So these things will happen and sometimes there's no quick solution to any of it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a fact. There's no quick solution. Time itself will work it out. Of course, it, it's a waste of time. <laughs> How much time have we got? Our time is limited, you know? How much time have we got? And they, they want to take more, waste more time just to, you know, something's not going to work, but they're so determined they want to do it. And you just have to let them go ahead. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything here? Yeah. As, uh, as Prabhupada says that uh, it will continue for 10,000 years. <laughs> so, our uh, uh, problems will also be solved and uh, we'll continue uh, to progress in this uh, the, the golden uh, age, the golden age of Kali Yuga will continue yeah. for 10,000 yes. years. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes. So we have a, um, uh, um, so many for hope. We have uh, reasons for hope, hoping <laughs> for a bright future. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, the future is always bright. <laughs> but the question, the question is how long you have to wait before you get the future. Okay. How much time have you got? Okay. Are you are complete? Done? Yes. Okay, let's hear group number one. No. You are still in the breakout room, Maharaj. You have to leave the breakout room. Oh, I have to leave the breakout room. Okay. Is... Okay. Recording in progress. Everyone's back? Yes, Maharaj. All right, so who, who's the spokesman for group one? Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, we discussed that uh, mainly like we don't see uh, the devotees in a right perspective. It is because of our egoistic nature. Uh, so we always consider that our point of view is right and we don't even think about what others are thinking. So it is because of our egoistic nature. And also it is because of our ignorance, uh, ignorance in the scriptures. Uh, so for example, like uh, the goldsmith can understand the quality of a gold, but who does not about, know about the gold, so they cannot value it. So similarly, it is because of our ignorance. So we don't know the quality of other devotees. So that is one thing. And then it is lack of Krishna consciousness. So we are not seeing everyone as a children of God. And because we are in between, like we are trying to practice Krishna consciousness, but we are almost in the part of Maya. So in that way, like we always uh, 
uh, don't see as Krishna's children. If we consider them also as a Krishna's children, so then we don't uh, think to find fault in them. And uh, and another thing is uh, when we know the scriptural point of view, like or uh, when we are strong in scriptural thing, so then we will not commit offense. Like because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mentioned, like it is a mad elephant offense. So when we commit offense, it's a mad elephant. Like if we really want to progress in our spiritual path, so then definitely we, when we know all these things, so then we will not even think about that. So to commit offense. And uh, and also like we should always in the guidance of our senior devotees so that like whether if we are saying something wrong so we can discuss like this kind of thought is coming like how I can overcome so in that way like we can take guidance from the senior devotees and uh, another point is like uh, Vaishnava etiquette we can learn from the association of the devotees so when we associate with the devotees then we know how we have to behave and uh, all those things we can learn uh, from the association of devotees only and uh, always uh, to practically follow this uh, we have to keep remember the famous like six shastra prayers like so if you really want to progress and chant our holy name eternally then we have to be humble so when we are humble then we don't uh, see the others fault and uh, the example we can see the Jagai Madai pastimes. So Nityananda Prabhu, even though he got hurt, so he wants to, uh, he went, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to kill, but he immediately pointed out that Jagai actually he stopped Madai to further hurt. So he see the good in others. So in that way, like if we, uh, whenever some uh, fault finding thoughts is coming, so then immediately we try to think what are the good qualities in them. So when we start meditate on that, so then automatically this fault finding will go away. So, and also we should not rest, uh, we should not expect the respect from others. So in, then we should always be ready to give respect to others. So in, if we are in that uh, meditation, then uh, mostly we will, uh, we can able to avoid uh, these offenses and we can see others perspective also. Very good. I think you covered everything. I think uh, our group also, we had many similar points which you covered. So very nice. Uh, would any of the other groups like to add anything which Mariji didn't mention? Well, group well, we, two will. We, are, we are not having separate uh, thing we have to add. Because we missed out some points, uh, what she read. We came in after our time was over. Uh -huh. And I saw she was already saying, so I don't know. Okay, do you have any new points which, which were not raised? Um, there might be, I don't know, Prabhuji, whether she covered this or not, but um, I can place this point as we are covered in three modes and our vision is impure. That is one of the reasons why uh, we see, uh, we fail to see the devotees in a proper uh, perspective. And also uh, uh, familiarity. Uh, so familiarity brings contempt. I don't know whether this was covered or not. So therefore, when we are uh, too much familiar with some devotees, then we uh, try to you know, we sometimes do offenses and envy all these scripts in. And uh, sometimes we also underestimate and uh, think that the devotees are, uh, or that devotee is less qualified than me. Maybe she or he doesn't speak good English or doesn't come from this country or that country and that may also bring that uh, you know superiority complex in us uh -huh. which is also an offense so uh that is another point i don't know whether it is covered or not and in the second question uh, i think humility is also covered but uh, that is one point which we also had and uh, we have to uh, so we have to understand that everyone has flaw and we cannot judge by their flaw. We have to see the good qualities rather than the bad qualities okay. in them. And uh, and I think she covered everything other than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she... Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.
Anybody else want to add anything? Group three or group four? Hare Krishna. Yes? Yes, Marj. Um, we discussed similar points. And uh, one of the points that was brought up by uh, Sim Krishna Prabhu is that uh, we have become conditioned to become judges. That we judge everybody by different uh, perspectives, wealth, uh, educational background, opulence. And so we've all become expert judges and we don't realize how quick we are to judge and that this is not a, a good facility or uh, attitude that we have and that we must work to uh, change that uh, reaction system that we have. And another point was um, we tend to forget even after joining ISKCON that we are still conditioned. We haven't yet made it. And so, you know, uh, because we are conditioned, we are bound to misjudge because we are still full of faults. So maybe we have become proud by joining ISKCON and thinking, yes, now I'm a sadhu sadhu. But really, we're not yet, you know, sadhu sadhu. So we should be more cautious and aware and not become too proud and, uh, you know, commit offenses by thinking we can really understand everything. Because, uh, you know, we have seen from ISKCON's history how many mistakes have happened at the highest levels. So we should just be more humble, like Mataji said, and uh, try to accept our real position that we're not so competent yet. This is what we discussed, Marat. Okay, sounds very good to me, very nice. Certainly I value these kind of statements, are very helpful. practical ways I'm <laughs> it that it's difficult to you know practically <laughs> implement these kind of things you know getting us out of the bodily concept and making us humble actually being humble genuine humility it's not easy what are practical ways the most i think the most important thing is very strict sadhana if people have proper sadhana, good sadhana, it will help, it will go a long way to developing these better qualities, the humility and the, the, the willingness to hear from others and not thinking ourselves to be superior or better than others. So it's actually meant to be like that. It's meant to be you know, that everybody would go to the morning program and everyone... Uh, they even have a ruling like, uh, to be a member of the GBC, you must attend the mor morning program, you must go to Mongol RT, <laughs> and these kind of things, you know. But it's difficult. Okay, we'll go ahead. It's, it, Can I tell you one other thing, March, practical? Yeah. So, in order to keep a position in the right place, we should remember two things and we should forget two things. The two things we should always remember, the good others have done to us and the bad we have done to others. And the two things we should forget are the good we have done to others and the bad others have done to us. And if we do this, we can remain in the right frame of consciousness. You're asking for a lot. <laughs> Yes, it's very, very true, Prabhu, very true, but it, it's, it's, it's not an e easy thing to get people to do that, always. Well, Ramya Prabhu was telling me that sometimes you get people that there's just no way, you know, if they don't apologize, I'm no, no way I'm going to work with them. <laughs> okay, we have to go ahead. Let's see what's next. Okay, text number nine. Yes, someone could read for me. Yes, the Lord says that Ex although he is the speaker, who speaks. The Lord says, the Lord says that although he is the predominating actor of the internal energy and although although the material world is sanctified just by the water that has washed his feet. He has the greatest respect for the Brahmana 
and the Vaishnava. When the Lord himself offers so much respect to the Vaishnava and the Brahmana, how can one deny such respect to such personalities? Okay, so this is one point, that the Lord himself offers so much respect, we should also be willing to offer respect to the devotees and the brahmanas. Go ahead, read text number 11, the quote there from 11. One may sometimes be faced with a diverse situation created by a brahman, but instead of meeting him with a similar mood, one should try to pacify him with a smiling face and mild treatment. Brahmanas and Vaishnavas should be accepted as earthly representatives of Narayana. All right. It's a grievous situation created by a brahmana. So instead of meeting him with a similar mood, in other words, a brahmana, is, someone's giving you trouble, are you going to try to give trouble back to him? Mm. So that instead of trying to meet him with a similar mood, you know, it's like instead of trying to go by the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, we should try to pacify him with a smiling face and mild treatment. <laughs> so this is the, the question, this is the, the, the principle in dealing with a, a difficult situation. Tolerance and smiling face and tolerance. Yes, someone can read this next qu quote, text 12. This incident, therefore, proves that those who have once entered a Vakunta planet can never fall down. The case of Jay and Vijay is not a fall down. It is just an accident. The Lord is always anxious to get such devotees back again to the Vakunta planets as soon as possible. It is to be assumed that there is no possibility of a misunderstanding between the Lord and the devotees. But when there are discrepancies or disruptions between one devotee and another, one has to suffer the consequences, although that suffering is temporary. Okay. So, fall down. Did Jai and Vijay actually fall down? No, it's not a fall down. Prabhupada said, it is just an accident. And the Lord is always anxious to get such devotees back again to the Vaikuntha planets. So they're leaving for some time, but they're coming back. So not a big problem, no reason to lament. There's no possibility of a misunderstanding between the Lord and the devotees. But when there are discrepancies, <laughs> So it's not a misunderstanding, but there's some discrepancy, there's some other reason, disruption between the devotee, one devotee and another. So you have to suffer the consequences, but the suffering is temporary. So that's the point. Suffering material world is temporary. It's purifying. Hmm? To go through some difficulties is purifying for us. We should tolerate. Okay, this jumped up to, to text number 25 here. Yes, yeah, someone could read, please. It is said that... Okay, Mataji, go ahead. It's okay, Mataji. It is said that the anyone who has implicit faith in the service of the Lord or who actually engages in transcendental loving service has all the good qualities of the demigods. Therefore, a devotee cannot be at fault. If sometime it is found that he is in error by accident or by some temporary arrangement, that should not be taken very seriously. In general, when dealing with devotees, we should try to try not, not try to find faults. In Bhagavad Gita also, it is confirmed that devotee who faithfully serves the Supreme Lord, even if found to commit a gross mistake, should be considered a sadhu or saintly person. Due to a former habits, he may commit some wrong, but because he is engaged in service of the Lord, that wrong should not be taken very seriously. 
All right? And so here's the, uh, that verse which someone brought up earlier this evening. They were talking about this verse from the Bhagavad Gita, Apichet Sudaracharo, Bhajate Mam Ananyabha. Someone may commit a gross mistake, but still he should be considered a sadhu or a saintly person. Hmm, due to former habits, he does some wrong. But devotees, we should think. Uh, we shouldn't take it very seriously. Why? Because, well, he's a devotee. Anyone who has faith in the service of the Lord. So this is the idea. We have to have faith in the Lord's service and we want to engage in service. And we should be developing the good qualities. That is the sign that we are actually becoming devotee, that we are becoming pure, that we're, we develop the good qualities just simply by engaging in devotional service. Prabhupada writes, a devotee cannot be at fault. <laughs> well, but there's difference of opinions. Sometimes it's found he is in error by accident or by some temporary arrangement should not be taken very seriously. Well, certainly Prabhupada saw things happen, different devotees he would put into responsible positions and he would give positions of leadership. And he saw that sometimes they would get in difficulty, they would have troubles. But Prabhupada always encouraged them, come back, continue. Certainly he never wanted them to go away from Krishna consciousness, that was the main thing. There was one devotee, he was in charge actually of the temple, it was in Detroit in Prabhupada's time. And so he did a lot of valuable service, he was a very nice devotee and he loved the deities, he did a lot of deity worship. And it was during his time that, uh, you know, Ambarish Prabhu, the, uh, the grandson of Henry Ford, had come there and become devotee. So Prabhupada was appreciating him. But the next time Prabhupada came to the Detroit, he, he saw the temple president had changed. And he, he said, what happened to the temple president? Where's the devotee who used to be in charge? And then the devotee said, oh Prabhupada, he was not chanting his rounds. We had to take him out. And Prabhupada was very upset. He said, what? He said, who told you like this? He said, the devotee was not chanting his rounds, then he can chant, he can, be, he, can he can start to chant his rounds. But you don't take him out. You don't remove him from his service. You don't get rid of him. And there were several different occasions. There was another time there was one devotee in Vrindavan. He was a, a European body devotee, an English devotee actually. And uh, Prabhupada liked him, Prabhupada was talking to him and so on. But everybody else, and particularly the temple president of Vrindavan, didn't like him and, he, <laughs> and he, he got him out of the temple. And when Prabhupada found out that the temple president had removed this devotee from the temple, Prabhupada was very upset. He didn't like that anybody should be sent away from Krishna consciousness. He wanted everyone to stay in Krishna consciousness, didn't matter what they'd done, but he always wanted them to come back. If the people went away, they had problems, but Prabhupada would overlook them and bring them back and, and give them responsible positions also. Sometimes leaders would have difficulties and, and you know, they'd get in difficulty, but when they would come back, Prabhupada would encourage them, come back, take up some service. He wanted them to be given responsible positions. Even though they had not kept up the standards, but as Prabhupada said here, it should be considered like an accident or an error. It shouldn't be taken very seriously. Of course, we should understand if it happens again and again that his devotional service is not of a very high standard. But still, he's a devotee. 
we should encourage them, everyone, to stay in Krishna consciousness. Okay, here's another, a little exercise, pair exercise. Maybe we can have pairs. Discuss with your partner any incident when you wrongly found fault with the devotees. And what were the consequences of such behavior in your own personal Krishna conscious life? Discuss what steps you plan to take to reduce this fault-finding tendency. When you wrongly found fault with the devotees, and what were the consequences of such behavior in your own personal Krishna consciousness? We'll have to be very honest here to recognize this. Huh? Might be difficult for us to recognize an incident where we were wrong, we found fault, someone. It will take some personal honesty. Okay, can, can we put devotees into pairs? Sure, Maharaj. It shouldn't take too long. Thank you. Try five minutes. Okay. Recording stopped.
माता जी कंप्लीटेड डिस्कशन आदित्य लता माता जी यस प्रभु जी महाराज आई गेस एवरीबॉडी हैज कंप्लीट वुड हैव कंप्लीटेड देयर डिस्कशन ओके क्लोज द ग्रुप्स ओके वी हैव टू गिव देम 1 मिनट मोर ओके I didn't expect respect. Everybody is back, Maharaj. All right. <clears throat> yes. So, would someone like to offer some feedback on this? <coughs> Recording in progress. <coughs> yeah, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, yes, Maharaj. Uh, during my stay in Iskand Burla Temple, Iskand Burla, Sambalpur, Odisha, I was going to my official. Duty in the morning and return back by 5 p.m. And prasadam I was receiving from the prasadam hall. A devotee was cooking with uh, nice prasadam, but mm -hmm. because of because of uh, delay in service prasadam to me or the reason that I was neglected in receiving prasadam in night time that uh, that uh, mm -hmm. intercepted my mind. I I I I was. Uh, yes, I was struck up by aggression, and uh, my in an angry mood, I shouted. I just I misbehaved the uh, not exactly misbehaved, but that uh, that uh, the sporadic emotions that uh, what that came out, and I uh, shouted. So, but that devotee was very good in cooking. He was serving much. That I just I repented. I lamented much thereafter. And uh, because of because of our mental complexities, our different occupational responsibility that does not match with the devotees. Because I by that time I I had recently joined in the temple. I was working in the in the mental environment for a long time, and that is not becoming synchronous with the with the standard of the temple. How to be with the devotees in the initial <coughs> stage of life? So that that created that that created a problem. That is the basic cause of. uh the the disharmony or that uh, that took place so that after i modified modulated myself to the standard that is uh, as it is desirable to be devoted in krishna consciousness that after i learned i started respecting the senior devotees and uh, by the by i i am trying to improve myself and, uh, oh. and i have already i have already formulated some sincerity plans and when i will approach the devotee i shall be humble i will be very very humble very compassionate uh, to the degree it is uh, it is desired by the by i will uh, develop myself okay very nice prabhu thank you very much very nice very honest description thank you yes anybody else like to offer i i can say very bad thing about me <laughs> yeah one time we were uh, uh, in a temple in uh, we were in atlanta actually and there is a very uh, there's a devotee my daughter was at that time she was uh, uh, four year old four or five year old and this devotee's daughter was two years older than my daughter so i saw her my daughter was very naughty of course very young age so she is going around here and there and try to make friends with everyone even in the temple so i saw that mother 
actually telling her child not to go and associate with her because she did not want distraction for her child which actually made me very sad and very hurt and from then onwards whenever i met in any association the lady and her daughter i was very apprehensive what is she going to do and i was telling my daughter not to go there you know so not get humiliated so this actually created some trouble in my mind i started realizing because maybe she is not affected she doesn't even realize that i heard her when she was talking to her daughter but it was affecting me of avoiding her and so what i try to consciously do even now what i do is whenever she is in a group when where i am i try to think that this was this is my karma why i got this first of all second point is it is true that my daughter was naughty and that is why she did because she wanted her daughter to be more krishna conscious and not in the playful mood and that's how i try to you know correct myself and hold myself and be responsible and not be uh, angry on her or upset on her mm, very good very nice very interesting really not in, not a, an easy job bringing up children is it and so many things to be considered <laughs> taking care of children very challenging okay thank you very much yeah we'll go ahead yeah someone can read this statement here The Lord stated that the punishment inflicted by the sages upon the door keepers Jay and Vijay was con was conceived by the Lord Himself. Without the Lord's sanction, nothing can happen. It is to be understood that there was a plan in the cursing of the Lord's devotees in Vaikuntha, and His plan is ex explained by many stalwarts. the fighting spirit also exists in the supreme lord otherwise how could fighting be manifested at all because the lord is the source of everything anger and fighting are also inherent inherent in in his personality when he desires to fight with someone he has to find an enemy but in the vaikuntha world there is no enemy because everyone is engaged fully in his service therefore he sometimes comes to the material world as the incarnation in order to manifest his fighting shrimad bhagavatam 3.16.36 okay so here we see the reason why the lord arranged this this uh, conflict here between the four kumaras and jain vijay actually the lord wants to fight this is explained to us by the acharyas that the lord desires to fight that fighting moods there in everyone and the lord also enjoys so who can he fight with he has to fight with some very special devotees not everyone can fight with the, just anyone can fight with the lord so the lord arranged for his two gatekeepers that they would be cursed and in this way they would go to the material world and they will take the form of demons and this will give the lord an opportunity to have a good fight mm. nice speech. Huh? Nice speech is that something very important so the lord has to fight he wants to fight and it he arranged that jai and vijay that they would come to the material world and they would take the form of demons in this way he would enjoy a good battle so this was the explanation why the lord allowed this because each person was saying they were responsible Jai and Vijay were feeling guilty that they stopped the four Kumaras from entering to the spiritual world. The four Kumaras were feeling guilty 
that they had cursed Jaya and Vijaya unnecessarily. But then the Lord comes along and he said it's all his responsibility. He feels guilt. He said it's my fault. I'm responsible for whatever happened. And here's the reason why the Lord arranged this, that he wants to fight so that the two gatekeepers will come to the material world and he can have a fight with them. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Yeah? Maharaj, uh, the spiritual world is complete. Yeah? And uh, here we can see the Lord's desire to fight is uh, because that quality is there. It's not necessary to inflict uh, suffering upon another person. So why is it that uh, in the spiritual world there is no fighting when we know that um, Krishna does fight with his friends when they're playing, they do wrestling, Prabhupada says it's a Vaishnava activity. So why is it that uh, it's not there or uh, has there been some explanation on that furthermore? Because here it just says that uh, there is no enemy but uh, friends also can wrestle as a sport. Well, Vaikuntha, so, remember, Vaikuntha... The, 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 we heard about the nature of Vaikuntha, there's perfect harmony there. There's no difference of opinion, there's no conflicts of interest. Everyone's in perfect harmony with the desire of the Lord. And the Lord of Vaikuntha is there, you know, he's, and he's worshipped with awe and veneration. So the mood of Vaikuntha is to give great respect and reverence to the Lord. So how can you fight with someone like that, when you have that mood? Of course, we know in days of old there were different kings and rulers and they would keep people, with the, they would keep people around who, who would fight with them just to keep them in shape. They'd have people there who could wrestle with them and bring, test their skills. But uh, in Vaikuntha, because He's the Lord of Vaikuntha, he cannot, you know, nobody will have the desire to fight with him. Because everyone is the devotee, they're all pure devotees. And they're worshipping the Lord in the mood of Vaikuntha, with awe and reverence, awe and veneration. So, how can you possibly fight? You can't, if you're giving so much respect, you're not going to fight. So they have to come to the material world. And by coming into the material world, then you get a real fight, not just a mock fight. You know, the, whatever they would do in, the, in Vaikuntha would just be a mock fight, it wouldn't be real, because all the time thinking the Lord. But by coming into the material world and by sending the gatekeepers to the material world, then the Lord gets a real fight. And look at, the, you know, he arranged the very powerful, very, very powerful demons. Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu were so powerful. They were so strong, they were invincible. And then they got blessing from Brahma as well. So the Lord wants to enjoy, and one of the ways in which he enjoys is by fight, and he wants to have a good fight. Then they relish it more, right? They relish it more. The, the, the more, the better the opponent is, the more you, you relish the fight. And, and so it's, it was arranged like this. They must come to the material world to do it. Right? But yes, Maharaj. Yeah, Maharaj, uh, but there is uh, there is fight in the Golok Vrindavan. Uh, during the child, childhood pastimes of Lord Krishna, that was Prabhu was asking. So there was wrestling, there was a group uh, fighting. Krishna was exhibiting in his pastimes. And uh, whether boy, this Vaikuntha planet is different from Golok Vrindavan or? Oh yes, Vaikuntha is different from Golok Vrindavan. Oh, right. And there are no, there, there, there are no real demons in Golok Vrindavan. In Golok Vrindavan, the, the demons are only in Gokula. 
And the demons are all killed by Vasudev Krishna. Ma Maharaj, for like for fighting uh, like that particular jiva is why it is required. Like any jiva, jiva can get no strength to fight with Lord. Is this uh, in strength? Jivatma also contributes something. That strength is uh, comes from material nature, no? Like suppose any other demons, whatever he does. So that strength, it comes because of his, uh, because of materialism, no? Well, yeah, somebody's born with a strong body, we could say that due to karma, somebody has the karma, they have a very strong, powerful body. So it was arranged that these two brothers who are coming, Haranyaksha, Haranyakashipu, that they would have very, very powerful, strong bodies. It was arranged. Why? Because the Lord knows he's going to fight with them and he wants them to be very powerful, very strong. Then he can give them a better fight. So Maharaj, whatever bodies Jivatma gets first time, suppose, uh, that is decided by the Lord or by his karma or something. The body we get, the bo material body is our karma, yeah. Daiva, according to the will of the Lord and our karma. There is the will of the Lord also and also karma. So, Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu, they fell from the spiritual world. They took birth in the womb of Diti, right? Originally the question was, what was the cause of the darkness in the universe? And it was described by Lord Brahma, the cause of the darkness was because of the two children who were in the womb of Deity, that they were demons. And they were very powerful, very powerful, very strong. We'll hear more about them in the coming chapter. Maharaj, can I ask one question? Yes. Whereas, uh, as it is a uh, general procedure, is that uh, the um, divas or the living entities, they come in the form of um, rain and they take shelter of uh, these um, grains and they go to their father and uh, they become uh, the blood and then in the semen. And then in that way they are injected into the, the mother's body. Uh, so in this case, actually, this is not so, this, this, this didn't happen in that way. Because uh, just uh, um, they were uh, just uh, after doing sex only at that time only they were injected. So it is different from the original usual process. Different from the usual process? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, well, it is it's described like that. Of course, that, that, that's one way in which particles fall. That was falling from the higher planets, that it comes down in the form of rain and that then the rain enters into the grains and then the grains are eaten by man and like that. Yeah, that's, it's described like that. That is describing yeah. about the, the, some jivas which fall from the higher planets. It's not. It's not always like that, but in okay. some cases it's like that. Okay, Mara. So fighting, <clears throat> did we read this slide? No, Maharaj. All right, you can read. Therefore, just as on a theatrical stage, someone takes the part of enemy to the proprietor of the stage, although the play is for a short time and there is no permanent enmity between the servant and the proprietor, so the Surajanas, devotees, were cursed by the sages to go to the Asurajana or atheistic families. That a devotee should come into an atheistic family is surprising 
but it is simply a show. After finishing their mock fighting, both the devotee and the Lord are again associated in the spiritual planets. That is very explicitly explained here. The conclusion is that no one falls from the spiritual world or Vaikuntha planet, for it is the eternal abode. But sometimes, as the Lord desires, devotees come into this material world as preachers or as atheists. In each case, we must understand that there is a plan of the Lord. Srimad Bhagavatam 3.6.26 So this is a very complex issue, you can see. <laughs> How devotees, they're devotees, they're falling from the spiritual world, but they're going to be atheists, they're going to be the enemies of the Lord, right? This was a curse, that because if they would take birth as demons, then they would come back to the Lord quicker. Remember, it was a that the Jai and Vijay. They simply prayed that if we have to go to the material world. long time there in the material world and we don't want to forget the Lord. So it was arranged that they would take birth in demons because if they would go as devotees then it would take longer time. But if they will go as demons then quickly they will be able to come back to the Lord. And in, order, in taking birth as demons they will develop, they will remember the Lord when they will remember the Lord in an angry mood, that their love, their relationship with the Lord would be based on anger, their hate and anger, anger towards the Lord. That was the, 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 the force which brought them back to Godhead quicker. And so as Jai and Vijay, they fell, they became Haranyakashipu and Haranyaksha. And we would say, how is it they were, they were devotees and then, then they become demons? Well, it was the arrangement of the Lord. You see, they were not ordinary demons. They were not ordinary demons like Venu, who never remembered the Lord, but they always remembered the Lord and they were very hateful of the Lord. And they were always against Him in a very inimical manner. A very angry mood. So that that was the, the curse which was put on them. Maharaj, I have a question that uh, in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that uh, a devotee he is uh, never perished and uh, he comes back and he uh, just like in Bhagavad Gita 9 chapter, he says, um, uh, Sasat Gachati. Uh, um, means very um, rapidly he becomes a devotee. So how that uh, devotee takes long time and a uh, demon takes a uh, short time in going back to spiritual? Well, the point was that it was the curse. That if, yes. if, you, if you take birth as a devotee, then you have to take seven births. Okay. So it's going to take a long time. But if you go as a demon, you just have to take three births. So it was arranged they would come as demons. And then they can come back to Godhead quicker. So my point from Maharaj is that uh, if one becomes a devotee, he cannot come back uh, sooner. <laughs> cannot what? Come back sooner to the spiritual world. But still, you, ha you go into the material world, just like you go as a devotee. Uh, what does the devotee do? Maybe he's doing meditation, you know, like you know, meditate for thousands of years. Like Markandeya Rishi got a blessing, he could live through the night of Brahma. So some devotees, they live a very long time in the material world. And Lord, the lifetime of Brahma is quite long. Brahma is a devotee, but 
it's a long he has a long life quite a long life by material standards right he's he has the longest life of anyone in the material world but he's a devotee so devotees also have a long life although you could say well it's only a breath of mahavishnu <laughs> what's the long life in the material world is actually just one breath of Mahavishnu. He breathes out and then breathes in. It's one breath. The whole that's one lifetime of Brahma. Is that a long life? Well, by spiritual standards it's not long. Yes. Okay, man. Thank you. I, I have a question, Maharaj. Uh, before that, Pada Sivar Prabhu, we, I don't have a qualification to be this type of enemy also. So, <laughs> this is the only way we can be. Um, probably Krishna will not come and kill us. We are not those, that's that fortunate. Um, uh, Maharaj, the question is, um, so here it is said that we have uh, like uh, Vaikuntha planet, no one falls down. But we all have come from Vaikuntha, right? Our origin is we are all eternal servitor of Krishna and we have come from there. So why did we then fall down? And why is it taking so much for us, so much time for us to go back? <laughs> you got it. Other Prabhu's question. <laughs> yes. Well, this, this is, a, of course, this is a, this is a big question. But which we, we don't really answer, we don't have the perfect answer for it, but there are different ways we can explain it. For example, where the marginal potency as the living entities, we're Tatasta Shakti. So even though we're in the spiritual world, we're the Tatasta Shakti, and we do have that free will that at any moment we want to leave there, we can leave. And so, we, you know, we have that free will. Krishna doesn't force us that we have to stay there because we are Tatasta Shakti. And so at any moment we can misuse that free will and come into the material world. So that's what happened. The vast majority of souls are in the spiritual world, but, you know, we, we somehow chose to come to this material world. So it was our choice. It's one explanation. The other explanation is that, you know, uh, this world is also the spiritual world, that we, are, we can be Krishna conscious here. You know, it's not that you just have to go there, you can be Krishna conscious here, right here, in this world. We just have to revive our consciousness of Krishna. And for, when we forget Krishna, that's when we're in the material world as soon as we forget Krishna. But when we remember Krishna, then we're in the spiritual world. This, this world becomes a spiritual world. For the pure devotees, they will see this world as a spiritual world. And they won't see any difference. And uh, Prabhupada also would give the example, he would quote the example given by his own spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he would speak about the, the tall fruit and the, the different philosophers would argue, why did the fruit fall? And one man said, well, the fruit fell because it was ripe. And the other man said, no, the fruit fell because the crow landed on the tree. And when the crow landed on the tree, it caused the fruit to fall. And, and this way they were arguing about the fruit. Why did the fruit fall? But it's not important. It's, it's foolish to argue about these things. What is important is to understand how to go back to Krishna. The most difficult thing to understand is how we fell from the spiritual world. But the easiest thing to understand is how to go back to the spiritual world. And we go back to the spiritual world simply by awakening our Krishna consciousness. So that's our real business, to become Krishna conscious. 
Yeah, by nature, we are all Krishna conscious. We somehow we felt, how did we get here? It's not important. Just try to understand how to get back, how to go back to Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. 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 Thank you, Maharaj.
another point which uh, we didn't bring up was uh, another reason why Jai and Vijay were going to the material world. There was a problem between them and Lakshmi. It was described that the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, wanted to come to see Lord Padmanabha, but Jai and Vijay would not allow her because the Lord was resting. And so when Jai and Vijay restricted the goddess of fortune entrance in to see Lord Padmanabha, then she also was angry at them and she cursed them. So that was another reason why they were also going to the material world, that they had upset the goddess of fortune. So that, that explanation was given there. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? Yes. We should never take up, even if we get a job as Jai Vijay, we should never take up that thankless job then. Because as a guard, he needs to do, uh, do his duty, but he cannot because he will be cast from here and there. Mm. Yes, yeah, you have to be careful what kind of job you take. Definitely a challenging job. You can make enemies, can't you? Yeah, some, sometimes like that. You, you, the, not all jobs are so pleasing. You make some enemies as well as some friends. Okay. So, so, so Maharaj, the chapter is now closed. <coughs> that the, the question what was uh, being discussed in the beginning of the class, Maharaj, that impersonalists, they are also classified as devotees. Impersonalists, no. They're, they're transcendentalists, but they're not devotees. Okay. They're transcendentalists. Means they have detached themselves from materialistic life. And they can enter into the spiritual sky, but generally they will just enter into the Brahma Jyoti. They won't enter into the spiritual planets. But Maharaj, the four Kumaras, the at the, at the doorstep of Vaikuntha planet, the quarrel took place. They were still impersonalists. After seeing the Lord, they were transformed into devotees. Yes. <clears throat> still the conception arises that the devotees were offended. They were prohibited to enter. They were not allowed to enter the Vaikuntha planet, etc. So on the background of recognizing them as devotees, that's why that strikes my mind. Question. On the background, I, I didn't get your question. I'm saying that the impersonalists, the four Kumaras were still impersonalists before their, before uh, they are seeing the Lord. They were on the gateway, the seventh gate. Yes. So after seeing the Lord, they became devotees. Before that, they were impersonalists. Yes. Right. So how they recognized as devotees by the Lord, that means Jai Vijay committed offense against them by not allowing, allowing them to enter inside. Uh, yes, but Jai and Vijay was arranged by the Lord. You know, that it was a, this whole incident was the arrangement of the Lord so that the Lord, so that Jai and Vijay will, can go to the material world and then they can fight with the Lord because the Lord desires to have a good fight, a good battle. He enjoys this pastime. So he arranged that these two gatekeepers would go there, become demons, and they'll give him a good battle. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. In, in connection with this question, then in text 31, uh, that Lord advised Jayabhija to perform mystic yoga in anger. Why they were not advised to perform devotional services? <laughs> Mystic yoga in anger. Because they're going as the demons, they're going as the enemies of the Lord. The Lord wants to have a fight. So it was arranged that they would go in that mystic yoga of anger. And in this way they will give a greater battle to the Lord. It 
If they were just simply God's devotees, the Lord already has so many devotees in the spiritual world. But he wanted, he wanted to enjoy this uh, rasa, this anger. He wanted to enjoy this fight with them. It was all, it's all the lila of the Lord that he wants to enjoy these pastimes with the demons. And so he sent his devotees, Jai and Vijay, to become demons in an angry mood and to fight with him because they are so angry, they're so hateful and so uh, envious and bitter towards the Lord, so they'll give him a better fight. The Lord will enjoy more that battle. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Again, in another in text 30, there is also Joy Bija had also committed a similar offense, not by allowing Lakshmi, goddess of fortune, to enter the Vaikuntha planet. Well, it wasn't they didn't allow her to enter the Vaikuntha planets, but they didn't allow her to go and disturb Lord Padmanabha. She wanted to go and see her husband, but they restricted her. So uh, she would, because the Lord was resting, so they were they were doing their job as servants. It's not an easy job. The Lord was resting, and they didn't want to disturb the Lord. Without, wait till the Lord wakes up. But Lakshmi didn't like it, and she thought these two gatekeepers are stopping me from going to see my husband. So she was so, not so, pleased. So Maharaj, does it, does it does not constitute an offence? <laughs> yes, you could say it's an offence, yeah. But it's an accident, it's not a serious offence. They were doing their duty. They were doing their duty. Was it an offence? Who was there, Who was offensive? Jai and Vijay were offensive by not allowing Lakshmi to go and disturb Lord Padmanabha. But they were doing their service for Lord Padmanabha. They didn't want him to be disturbed. They wanted him to have rest. Maharaj, Ramaya Prabhu want to add something. Yes. Maharaj, two small items. One is that uh, it seems what it means when the Lord wants to fight, that means the opponent will be killed, which could not happen in Vaikuntha. Okay. And the other point is that um, if Krishna has the desire to fight in Vaikuntha, it would seem that the Jiva could also have that desire. Oh, definitely. That's mentioned, that the desire, because the... The, because the jivas have that desire, the desire is also there in the Lord. Yeah. We see a lot of fighting, you know, just like right now that we've got Russia and Ukraine fighting, you know. <laughs> why, why are they fighting, you know, just they have that desire to fight, you know. This human nature, this mentality of lording over one another. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, uh, I heard before in one lecture, so I wanted to reconfirm uh, that one, my understanding. Uh, this uh, Kumaras, uh, they were imper impersonalists. So I heard in lecture that impersonalists are two types. One is Brahma Bhadi, another is Nirakar Bhadi. Okay. So Nirakar Bhadi, they are not allowed by Gita. Yeah. But whereas the Brahma Bhadi, they are allowed, uh, even though they are not devotee, but they accept the Lord. So, uh, Maharaj, could you please uh, elaborate a little so that we have better understanding? Well, we said the Brahma Bhadis, they understand the Brahman, they are attracted by the Brahman. They're just not attracted so much to devotional service. Their attraction is more for the Brahman. So just like Jai and Vijay, they never had the opportunity at, to actually see the Lord. So they had never awakened their interest towards devotional service. 
their interest was simply on contemplating the Brahman. And they, they simply absorbed themselves in contemplating the Brahman. But they had heard about the Supreme Brahman, they'd heard about the Lord, Lord Brahma had told them about the Lord, they'd heard about him, but they hadn't taken it very seriously, they were more inclined towards the Brahman. And that's how they became, they were simply Brahmagyanis. And so they entered into the spiritual world, but when they actually met with the Lord directly, then there was a change in the heart. It came about that there was a transformation due to seeing the Lord and smelling the aroma of the Tosis from his lotus feet. It entered their nostrils and it brought about a change in their heart. And so from Gyanis, they became Shanta Bhaktas, Bhakta devotees in Shantaras. Devotee in Shantaras means, Shantaras means they appreciate the opulence of the Lord, but they don't actually engage in any service. And so that was the position of the four Kumaras. They, they were attracted, they saw the beauty of the Lord, they, very nice, beautiful, and, and very wonderful. And they took shelter of the Lord, but they, they don't do any service. They're in Shantaras. Thank you, Maharaj. They were not uh, uh, Nirakarma. Nirakarma means that's completely, uh, they don't uh, denying the, uh, the, the form of the Lord. Right. They were not Nirakarma. Yeah, right. They were not Nirakara. Yeah. But they were Brahmakyanis. They were attracted by the Brahman. They just did not feel that an inspiration to take up devotional service. Yet, although Lord Brahma had told them, but still, it just wasn't enough to get their interest. They had to actually, when they went there and saw the Lord, then they understood, oh yeah, this is it. And they were definitely attracted. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, in Shantaras also uh, uh, there is service, right? Like trees and all, they also serve Krishna by giving fruits and flowers. And Kumaras also used to do, I mean, they, they also do service like preaching, right? In every, in many places we see that uh, uh, the Kumaras go for preaching purposes, right? Yes, sometimes we hear about it, that they came to Maharaj Prithu sacrifices. We hear about Sanat Kumar coming there. But generally their mood is Santaras. Okay. But in Santaras there is no service? I mean the trees, plants, they do serve, isn't it so? Well, not all trees, some trees. Yeah, some trees will be doing service, not all, all the trees. It depends, you know. Definitely, you could say trees, cows like that, Santaras. But is that just the nature is there. The nature is there. Just you know that they're just appreciating the opulence, not actually actively engaging in the Lord's service. Okay. The four Kumaras. I think the nine Yogendras are also in Shantaras. Uh, Maharaj. Actually, I have two doubts. Uh, can I ask? Uh -huh. uh, in the uh, text 2 of 16th chapter, the translation it is stated that uh, the personality of God had said, these attendants of mine, Jai Vijay, have committed a great offense against you because of ignoring me. I did not get uh, that. Have committed a great offense against you by because of ig ignoring me. Ignoring me. Yeah. Um, so I did not get how, like Krishna saying they ignored because of offense uh, because they they were ignoring Krishna. So I did not get this. Well. 
the four Kumaras, oh, Jaya and Vijaya have committed an offence. Let me see, I have to look at the verse. Text number two, eh? In the verse or in the purport? It's in the uh, translation, yeah. Yeah, Jain Vijay, by name, have committed a great offence against you because of ignoring me. <laughs> well, they've committed the offence against the four Kumaras by ignoring me. In other words, they've gone against it, the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord. They should not have stopped <laughs> the four Kumaras. So the, the four Kumaras are also, you know, they're also dear associate. they're servants of the Lord. They're not as intimate as Jai and Vijay. Jai and Vijay are more closely connected to the Lord. But the four Kumaras are also, you know, they're, they're very senior in the universe. They are the oldest sons of Lord Brahma. And so they have that free will that they can come into the spiritual world and that they can come into the Vaikuntha planets. But uh, Jai and Vijay have restricted them. Right, Prabhupada said, this is a remarkable fact in the dealings of the Lord and the servitor, as seen in the present incident. Offending a devotee, one neglects the Supreme Lord Himself. So that's the point. This word, atikraman, offending a devotee, by offending a devotee, we neglect the Lord. Because the, the devotee is the representative of the Lord. And if we don't properly respect the devotees, then it's an offence against the Lord. And the Lord will take it more seriously. The Lord can tolerate offences against himself, but he cannot tolerate offences against his devotees. So the devotees, they have taken shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord. Now here you have the four Kumaras, they have come into the spiritual world. Of course, they may, we may say, well, they're not devotees yet, they're brahma but they're very elevated souls. They're saintly persons. They're dedicated to self-realization. They may not be fixed in devotional service yet, but still they're very, very elevated souls and we should respect them. Hmm? So they've come to the spiritual world and they should be given respect. And if we don't pro properly respect them, then it's an offence against the Lord also. Then the Lord is not pleased. Uh, another question was, uh, in the text 15, the, in word to word, the meaning of Parmeshtya is of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And uh, in the purport, okay, I got it. Maybe Parmeshtya means the opulence of Brahma. Oh. So maybe, it, does it mean the opulence of Brahma coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead? That's right. Of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the word to word translation. In the word for word translation? Uh, the meaning is of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the purpose, the Parmeshya meaning is uh, opulence of Brahma. <laughs> <laughs> so mainly because it's a, uh, always coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that's why it's uh, something like that. Where does it say the per opulence of Brahma? In the purport? Yeah, in the purport it is a bit opulence. Oh, oh, well, in the purport there's a different thing. The higher opulence in the material world is called paramishya, the opulence of mm -hmm. Brahma. 
param estya, the opulence of Brahma. But that material opulence of Brahma, who lives on the topmost planet within them, cannot compare to the opulence of the Supreme Lord. <laughs> so, is it? Well, the word for words, you know, I, I think the purports are more important than the word for word. The word for words are. Prabhupada used to have a Sanskrit editor who would do the word for word for him. So the word for word probably was done by a devotee, but Prabhupada's purport is more reliable. And Prabhupada is put here, Paramistya, the opulence of Brahma. And he mentions about the opulence of Brahma, how it cannot compare to the opulence of the Supreme Lord. Hmm. You read it very carefully. It's a, <laughs> you made it's a good point to note. You picked out this point, huh? Yes, in the word for word meaning, there's a di the difference there. It says the opulence of the Lord. And there it says, opulence of Brahma. How to? I think we should go by the go by the purport. Yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Okay, you're saying something for the previous question, Maharaj? Yeah, um, yeah, I was okay. telling her better to stick with the purport. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, Prabhu, you can ask a question? Uh, yes, Maharaj. I just wanted to verify that, as you said, Maharaj, sometimes we see that many advanced devotees also in ISKCON, they suffer a lot. Uh, 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 as just you know, she said maybe. Uh, so why does that happen, Maharaj? There are different reasons uh, due to giving initiation to unqualified disciples, or sometimes because of own sinful reactions. How to think about it, Maharaj? Yeah, but both reasons are valid. It could be either way. It could be due to accepting unqualified disciples, and it could be also due to their own inattention their own slackness and sadhana and negligence and spiritual practice, that it happens, that it does happen, that in the beginning a person may be very good and, and, and good Krishna consciousness and it may appear to be very qualified. We see some people, you know, in, in the beginning they were very good, they were very qualified and they were working very well and Prabhupada gave them the chance initiate disciples and not so on like that, but then they get into spiritual difficulties. Why do they get into spiritual difficulties? Well, it, as you say, it could be accepting unqualified disciples, but it can also be due to our own negligence in spiritual practices. Sometimes we become proud also becoming careless and not strictly following all the principles. Yes. So, yes, just so like... Can we say that it is... It's just like I, we were reading today that even in the spiritual world there's possibility of offence. Right? That even in Vaikuntha you can commit offences. Yes, ma'am. So the same way, just because you, somebody is elevated, may be considered a spiritual master and like that, a leader in the society, doesn't mean he can, cannot make offences. He can also make offences. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, thank you, yes, Maharaj. So can we say that it is only due to offences and not the sins of previous lives? Or can we say that because of sins of the previous lives also it happens? Well, sins of previous life, you know, someone's already a devotee, they're engaging in devotional service, their sins of previous life should be eradicated by devotional service. I'm not... 
I, I, I'm doubtful that a person's spiritual difficulties could be due to previous life. But what may happen is that the person becomes slack in his spiritual practice. Initially he becomes slack in spiritual practice and then because he's slack in spiritual, then the sins from the past life, then they come back on him. Because he's, yes. because he's given up the shelter of Krishna. So he goes back under the material energy and he takes on his old karma. Yes, Maharaj. One more reason, Maharaj, I heard from, I think, Kadam Kanan Swami Maharaj was telling that uh, Krishna can alter the reaction for a devotee. Sometimes he increases the reaction to, uh, to so that he can, and a person gets purified much faster. So that he gets purified faster, so he double or triples the reaction so that he progresses fast and is purified. <laughs> he gets triple the reaction, eh? double or triple the reaction, so he gets purified. Well, that's an interesting theory. I don't. It could be true. Why not? Krishna can do these things. Krishna certainly can do these things to us just to purify us, to bring us out of our ignorance. And to make it, just like we saw in, in Srimad Bhagavatam, you have the example of Chitraketu, how Chitraketu was cursed by Parvati and he became Vritasura. And so in the body of Vritasura, you know, he had, he had this terrible body, a huge body, demon body. And he had, he had to suffer his arm cut off and then the other arm cut off and then he swallowed Indra and Indra cut him out, cut out from his intestine and then Indra cut off his head. <laughs> so, you know, this was, this was, you could say this was incredible karma, but he got rid of all that karma, he could go back to Godhead. So sometimes, as you say, triple suffering it's to get rid of all the karma, just so that make it quicker to go back to Godhead. Yes, Maharaj. So, there are many reasons for suffering. Yeah, the, 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 the suffering which the devotee goes through is not ordinary. That usually we don't think of the suffering to be karma. If, if he's still a devotee, if he's still in Krishna consciousness and he's suffering, it's not karma, but it's special mercy of Krishna. Sometimes, just like the Pandavas suffered so much, it's to show the greatness of their devotion. And you can see Haridas Thakur, it's to show Haridas unflinching faith in the holy name, that he could be beaten so much, but he just tolerated it. So, bring out yes. the greatness of the devotee, sometimes Krishna puts the devotee through these difficulties to show how steadfast they are, despite so many difficulties, that they'll never give up the shelter of Lord Krishna. But it's not karma. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. And at this small point, Maharaj, this, uh, the the Veer Rasa, how can it be a Rasa if it is not present in the spiritual world and Krishna has to come to the material world to taste it? Uh, well, it, it was that the, they had to come to the material world in order to, to fight with the Lord. That fighting spirit, and, the, and as we heard, the Ramya Prabhu was pointing out, killing also, you know, the bring about the actual death of the other person, killing the person. So that's in the material world. You're not going to do like that in the spiritual world. There's none of that going on in the spiritual world. But it will be much greater drama, much more intense in the material world. Yes, mm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? 
Okay, so then we'll finish here tonight. Uh, we still have chapters 17, 18, and 19. Uh, if you look through them, they're brief chapters. There's not much in the way of purports there. So we'll finish them in the next class. So the next class will be the last class for this unit. So that will be on Saturday. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you, Lord Bhakti Vrinda Ki.